Lone Star College is one of the largest community colleges in the nation, serving more than 93,000 students. Our ability to deliver the highest quality education and training to the widest population is always improving. First delivering online courses in 1997, Lone Star College now enrolls more students in online courses than any other college in the nation. In addition to our robust online certificate and degree options, we are the first college in Texas to offer registered apprenticeship programs. As a community college, our mission is to put students on the path to success and advance our entire community, resulting in a $3 billion economic impact in the Houston area. Lone Star College makes education accessible and available to all. We serve the largest Hispanic student population in the nation and are the second largest provider of associate degrees to Hispanic students in the United States. We are committed to bringing value to our students and to the community through the expansion of education. Through innovative and relevant programs, Lone Star College succeeds in its mission, delivering wide-ranging opportunities that change lives. Lone Star College is one of the largest community colleges in the nation, serving more than 93,000 students. Our ability to deliver the highest quality education and training to the widest population is always improving. First delivering online courses in 1997, Lone Star College now enrolls more students in online courses than any other college in the nation. In addition to our robust online certificate and degree options, we are the first college in Texas to offer registered apprenticeship programs. As a community college, our mission is to put students on the path to success and advance our entire community, resulting in a $3 billion economic impact in the Houston area. Lone Star College makes education accessible and available to all. We serve the largest Hispanic student population in the nation and are the second largest provider of associate degrees to Hispanic students in the United States. We are committed to bringing value to our students and to the community through the expansion of education. Through innovative and relevant programs, Lone Star College succeeds in its mission, delivering wide-ranging opportunities that change lives.
Hi, y'all. My name is Alexa Uda, and I'm a reporter for the Texas Tribune. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on how voting and elections could change under some of the proposals being considered at the Texas Capitol. I am joined today by Haider Garcia. He is a Tarrant County Elections Administrator and Isabel Longoria, who is the Elections Administrator for Harris County. Uh, Haider has served in his role since 2018. Uh, during that time, he's shepherded the county through its move to countywide voting so voters could cast their ballots anywhere on Election Day. Before that, he worked as an elections manager in California. Isabel was sworn into her position late last year. She was previously a special advisor on voting rights and access in the elections office, championing initiatives like 24-hour voting for the 2020 election. And before we begin our conversation, we also want to thank the Texas State Technical College, Lone Star College, and Invest Texas Council for supporting this event. Okay, so we are going to talk about how elections may change in Texas moving forward, but I actually want to first take us back to the 2020 general election. Obviously, nationally and in Texas, a lot of these proposals to change the election process or enact new restrictions are sort of rooted in these concerns about voter fraud, of which we know there are documented cases, but no evidence that it's widespread or massive in scale. But knowing that that's the political backdrop for some of these things on the table at the legislature, I was hoping that you could both briefly tell me about how your elections actually went in November. You know, the Secretary of State's office has said that our election statewide was smooth and secure. Uh, would you say the same for your individual elections? And Isabel, I'll go to you first on this one. Absolutely. Uh, elections in Harris County went really, really well for us. Uh, we had about 1.6 million people come out, which was about 68 percent of voters, which was actually higher than normal, uh, even for a presidential election. Uh, we did you know, mail ballot voting. We did 24 hour voting, drive through voting, even our initiatives. Uh, we had hundreds of thousands of people come out, which was really exciting for us to try those initiatives and see that voter access. When you provide voters with options, they come out and use those options. And one thing you'll be hearing about me for the, the rest of the day is not um, that voter fraud or you know whatever was an issue. Uh, really, that number, that 68 percent turnout, that was the most disappointing to me. I want to see that closer to 100 uh, percent. And I, you know, I, I can only imagine the rest of elections administrators feel the same. Uh, for me, it's about how can we get more people voting. Uh, not quibbling over small questions that have come up about just, you know, kind of small technicalities. Sure. Hyder, how did yours go up in, in, in Tarrant County? It went, it went very well. Um, kind of a similar result. We had a same 68% turnout, uh, highest we've had in years, if not the highest of all. Um, a lot of participation. We saw people kind of adapting to the circumstances, uh, whereas usually you would have seen a, a comparable amount of people voting early and on election day. We saw about 80% of voters, 70% of voters vote uh, early and just about 10% vote on election day, uh, which is a huge, huge change, right? I think people were responding to to this anxiety that was around 2020 and and, and just wanting to make sure their voice was heard uh, with plenty of time. Um, we had that incident with the ballots that we had to remake because of the of the misprinting of them. Uh, but again, I think watchers responded pretty well and were very helpful and, and wanting to follow through the process and saying, you know, things happen in elections. It's part of the process sometimes. And you just have to adapt and make sure you follow the law to get back on your feet. So even even the hiccup went well is what I'm trying to get at, right? Everything was pretty, pretty um, as expected in many ways. Yeah, I know it was. I remember talking to a lot of you sort of in the lead up to you or your colleagues in the lead up to this election and the way it had to be reimagined in so many ways um, was pretty significant. Uh, so I think everyone's pretty happy to have that one behind us at least. Uh, so obviously things remain in flux at this point at the legislature in terms of what final changes could actually be made to elections. But still on the table are restrictions on early voting hours, restrictions on voting options like drive-through voting in Harris County, a ban on proactively sending out applications to vote by mail, new regulations for polling place distribution, you know, all these restrictions that sort of largely take away some of your power as election administrators, or at least some flexibility uh, to tailor your elections. And so knowing things could still change in the final version of the main elections bill, Senate Bill 7, you know, tell me about 
the cost of losing that flexibility, right? Whether it's early voting hours, whether it's polling place distribution, what is the cost for you all in when that goes away or that's restricted beyond where it's at now? I'll take this one first. You know, it's it's interesting. It's no secret um, that uh, some of the provisions uh, that have come up in Senate Bill 7 are specifically targeted at what we were able to come up with, right, um, in Harris County. Things like drive through voting, though we weren't the only county, we, we did happen to be the biggest county doing it. Um, things like uh, sending out mail ballot applications to our seniors, folks over 65 who were concerned or maybe don't have the same access to technology to go and download it on the computer because we don't have online voter registration or online mail ballot registration. Um, things like the expanded hours. Again, we're not the only county doing it. And I can't stress this enough. You know, I, I think Harris County gets a lot of unfair credit. We are using best practices that our peers have used across the state and across the country for doing 24 hour votings for folks like uh, our election workers or sorry, our uh, medical uh, folks, our first responders who during COVID couldn't get out to vote between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Um, but, you know, kind of ultimately what I think this will do in, in hurting Harris County is not hurt us as elections administrators. My job is to figure out and follow the law, right? My job is just to provoke, provide voting and elections, period, no matter what, no matter if it's, uh, you know, etching it on stone tablets and we have to carry those stone tablets. That's my job. What I want to really turn around is this hurts voters, right? The voters who in Harris County have been using drive through voting for the past four elections, Next November are going to ask, where is that? I had planned my life around it. It was easy for me to take my elderly parent or my kids to go vote. Now, what do I do? Right. Uh, those folks who are saying, thank goodness, I know I can go vote at 9 p.m. now. And at one time I could even go vote at 2 a.m. What do I do now? Because now I'm back to having those limited options. And so I think unfairly the conversation has been, well, you know, how can we punish elections administrators or keep them in line or, you know, somehow punish the, the leadership of counties that we just don't like for whatever reason? You are punishing the voters. You are punishing the people that you hope vote for you in those elections. And every elected official that's making these decisions now has an election coming up. And so what I like to say is, you know, we're, it seems like in Texas where uh, the leadership is really cutting off their nose to spite their face. Uh, you ultimately hurt the people that you need to vote for you. Uh, and I think that's a really bizarre situation to put us in as elections administrators um, to handcuff the options that voters want. Um, and so it makes me very, very sad and very nervous for the state of elections in Texas. Hyder, what's been your assessment so far? <laughs> You know, um, it, it's interesting because when you when you have Isabel and I here, we have a, a very different experience, right? A lot of these things that that are being uh, mentioned in the law, we didn't we didn't do them. We didn't have drive through voting. We didn't have twenty four hour voting. We didn't have extended hours. So, in essence, I could run the same election I run in twenty twenty and get to that you know since sixty eight percent highest turnout we had without any of those. Um, so you know, it, and and it comes to show a little bit of how different realities in different counties need different solutions. Right. So we didn't try some of the things that she mentioned. We tried other things. We had multiple places open in the last days. We had an increased number of machines. We had different uh, different approach to it. And we got sort of the same result, that 68, almost 70 percent turnout. Um, and I think that illustrates, you know, it is really important for local officials to be able to assess the reality they have on the ground in their you know county and say what are the best measures what is the what i can do for my my, my voters that they will react better to right um so but to me that is an essential principle that that should remain for us as local officials to be able to say my options are out there but these are the ones i'm going to pick and this is how i'm going to put together my election to make it um, more accessible and easier for the people in my area um one of the comments that I remember the most from this session was um, one of the representatives who said something like, you know, uh, they were arguing about something in Harris County. And he said, you know, there are 253 other counties, right? In my county, people go vote in the horse. And so decisions that are going to be made in that county are completely different than what I'm going to do in, in you know, in the, in the Fort Worth uh, area in Tarrant County or what Isabel's going to do in Harris County because you don't go vote in the horse. 99.99% of people don't in our counties, right? Um, so I think that's important. That That's probably the bigger impact is, um, limiting that ability that we have to figure out what's best on our ground. Doesn't mean that everything that is being discussed is necessarily something that everyone would want to do, but we should have the ability to choose how we feel we're going to better serve people in our community. 
Sure. I mean, so let's go through some of these specific proposals and their their possible impact. You know, I want to start with early voting hours because, Isabel, this is something you've specifically addressed before that you and I have talked about before, because y'all calculated this and counted. It was more than 17,000 voters in the 2020 general election who cast their ballots during these extended early voting hours that could be banned under Senate Bill 7. Some of that was 24-hour voting and also some of that was past 7 p.m. when you you kept a few locations up and open until 10 p.m. You know, what kind of voters did you all try to serve with those extended hours? I know you mentioned uh, medical workers earlier, but tell us sort of your thought process in enacting these extended hours that that could maybe no longer exist under Senate Bill 7. Yeah, I'll I'll give you a really specific example. You know, one of the populations we were looking at um, was medical workers in our, Houston has one one of the largest medical centers in the country, medical workers who were fighting COVID and for a couple of reasons, one, because of schedule, wouldn't be able to, you know, make it out to the garage, stop, go vote somewhere else, come back, right, and still do their shift. And for honestly, for safety reasons, they may not have felt comfortable, right, depending on what kind of exposure they had in their day-to-day life, going to another center and risking any kind of contamination to the public. Then we were very grateful in San, in, sorry, in San in Houston to not have, right, any major exposures leading from any kind of COVID at voting. But there's a couple of things we did, and I think this is a great comparison. We put an early vote location directly in the medical center for the first time ever in one of the hospitals that was central to the other hospital so that medical workers could get to it faster, that whatever time they had, even if it was a lunch break, they could at least walk there with some place they were they were used to walking. And so, you know, those are things that would be allowed in the laws, no matter what passed or in the past. But we still had voters, doctors, nurses, janitorial staff, patients that were there voting in those extended hours. So when people tell me, well, extended hours doesn't make sense, add more locations. Even when we add those locations, there are still people using it because their schedule does not allow them to get out from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and in those 10 p.m. hours. And so I know one of the provisions early on, and let's get it straight, right? Uh, Right now, uh, there's kind of a version that came out of the Senate that had everything thrown in it that we're worried about. There's a version that came out of the House that uh, is bad, maybe not the absolute worst version, but still guts and prohibits a lot of things for our election workers, for us as election officials, and really shifting power to poll watchers. Um, Now in conference, all of those things are back on the table. So that's why I'm still nervous, right? It's not like, oh, uh, not as worse as it could have been. We got out of that safe. But the idea then with 24 hour voting, right, is uh, one of those provisions of the bill would say, well, you can you can do it from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., but you can only do it for 12 hours. So you can't do it for that full 14 hours. And so what that's going to say is I have to now choose. Do I keep consistent hours, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m.? So voters understand maybe it's a little uh, easier to them to get used to it. Or do I have to start shifting from day to day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., now 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., now 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then I don't even get to go past into those evening hours that help people out. And so, you know, again, the idea is like there are options, but it's not going to make it easier for the voter. It's going to make it inconsistent for our workers. And so that's what I kind of really keep pushing on. Right. And, And to Hyder's point, there are options. We can host an election. Absolutely. Even if it's on inscribing on stone tablets, I will host an election. But having the options, having the flexibility to meet our voters and more importantly, not punishing 253 other counties for what Harris County wanted to do and try out for our own voters, I think is a really great point that Heider raised. You know, Heider, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier, you could in some ways essentially do the same election because a lot of the things in these bill, in in the Senate version of, of this bill, at least, wasn't something that you all took up in this last election. There is one proposal, though, that would force, you know, the largest counties in the state basically to right. redistribute your polling places. It's a complex formula probably for the sort of average pr- person, but it's it's essentially based on voter registration by state house district in each of your counties. And, you know, we've been analyzing this and the effect is pretty stark in both of your counties, actually, you know, pulling places from democratic districts or districts in the urban core in particular, um, you know, districts that have higher shares of voters of color. Heider, how do you see this sort of more standard formula like this impacting your voting sites? And obviously, I'm not expecting you to know exactly which ones would shift, but just sort of broadly, 
how would it impact it? Because a formula like this does sort of ignore some of the factors that y'all take into consideration, right? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, obviously, it's one of those, you know, we can we can make it work, but it certainly doesn't need to be that complicated. The result of it, right? We could be, and and so for people who don't know what this is, it's there's a formula that is was at some point an SB seven, and I think one of the amendments took it off, but I'm not sure if it's in. It's it's a little confusing right now what's on the table and what could come out. But if it were to stay, the one that we that we were worried about in Tarrant County, uh, it basically says, look, depending on where people live, you're going to have a specific number of vote centers, and within those vote centers, you have to have a um, regulated amount of machines. And it used uh, some some non-specific language like uh, similar amounts of machines in different locations. And and you know what I particularly find a little bit contradictory is that that was a proposal to put into Section 43007 the vote center section. So it's trying to say, you know, we're going to determine how many resources to put based on where people live exactly in the code section that says people can go anywhere and they don't have to vote where they live. So it it, kind of ties our hands. I wish they would have probably put some language in there saying, you know, look at your data and the patterns of where people are choosing to go, not where they um, are living, because that can really affect, right? And I always give examples of places in Tarrant County, like South Lake Town Hall or the Southwest Courthouses that may have, you know, 2,500 people vote on election day, whereas some neighborhood school may have 150. Um, and, and so it's going to be hard for people if that passes and we have to do something like that to show up at, you know, again, say uh, Keller Town Hall and, and say, we used to have 40 machines here. Why do we have 10? Well, because we can't have more than 10 because then you would have more than the little school in the neighborhood even though people are choosing to come to this town hall to vote and I've gotten used to it. So that, that is important. There are probably workarounds, right? So instead of having one place with 30 machines, we would have to find three places, staff three places divided by three, have sort of the same number of machines around, but it would still confuse people that would show up at a place where they used to go and say, now there's a long line where this was, you know, kind of an express mega center or something. Um, again, going back to, you know, we have the data to support those decisions and we understand where our voters go and how they behave. We've been tracking that for two years since we joined the Vote Centers program. Um, so there are ways to make decisions. I understand. I, I, I really can understand what the spirit of it is, right? Um, nobody, you know, Tyler could be a very nefarious EA who wants to favor Alexa to win her commissioner precinct and is going to have twice the number. I get it. And it makes sense to say, look, you got to figure out a way to to respect their voters and treat them even. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about the formula and the way to get there and to guarantee that um, because there can be unintended consequences in some of these regulations. Sure. Isabel, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, I I will say, so we took it a step further in Harris County and um, we analyzed uh, the bill, right? Uh, The various versions. And uh, to Hyder's point, at one point it said anyone who could possibly be a voter. So were we supposed to calculate birth rates? Were we supposed to calculate, you know, who's moving in and out of the area? Uh, you know, there's a lot of movement because of COVID. Uh, so I think they rolled back and they said, well, we're going to float between who's a registered voter or who's citizen voting age population or just voting age population. And those may sound similar, but they all have very minute differences. For example, um, if you do it just based on uh, the voting age population, you might have uh, a large number of uh, Hispanic individuals, right, who are living, this happens in Harris County, who are living in an area that kind of increased that portion. Whereas if you're only looking at citizen voting age population, then it starts narrowing down. Uh, Or because of, you know, kind of turnout rates and voting rates in in some of our minority communities, it narrows down who's actually turning uh, up to vote and who's actually actually registered to vote. And so we ran it based on all of those factors, any way you calculated it that had been offered in one of those iterations of the bill. And we did it by house district. And to us, it was incredibly shocking. Um, the every area, almost every single area that is currently represented by someone who is Latin, Black, or Asian loses voting locations and voting machines in the way we calculated it. And all of those areas represented by uh, really kind of white representatives gain voting machines and voting locations. And that is uh, abstracted from party, right? We are just looking at the racial demographics of our location. And I think what gets lost in the conversation is in Harris County, when we picked voting locations for November, 2020, we used a resource that the Secretary of State promoted as a tool, right? Um, Being used by one of the universities out in California that came and said, look at locations and how close they are to public transportation. 
look at where people are voting to Hyder's point historically, socially, where they might vote in the daytime versus the evening, where you're going to have higher rates of mail ballot voting versus in-person voting, um, where you've had many locations that even if they've only had 10 voters, it matters to that population. And we also look at in Harris County, where are the places that can actually have voters? We've got a lot of new development, great bigger high schools that have those big rooms. But because of a historic tie to racism and urban development in large counties like us, those areas that have Black and Latin voters specifically don't have big new buildings. They tend to depend more on the smaller churches, the smaller community centers. And so we have to have more locations there, right, because they fit fewer people per per location, where in some other areas we can have fewer locations, but they fit five to 10 times more people at any given time. And so, you know, it's it's much more of a delicate balance in an art form than it is uh, just kind of rolling the dice and, and hoping for the best. Yeah, just to give you an idea, Alexa, just if I can just add something to that. I mean, when we, again, for me, it's really important to contrast that you can have very different realities <clears throat> in areas that people may kind of assume they're the same, right? They're two big urban areas, so they're probably the, the same thing. When we, when we, uh, did the whole analysis to join the, the vote centers program. We had a citizens advisory committee. And one of the questions that came up was, you know, vote centers lets us reduce the number of locations. And one of the points that they made a lot of, you know, emphasis on was we shouldn't reduce because someone's going to be further away. And we had to analyze a lot of uh, census data, uh, uh, car ownership, vehicle ownership, and all of that to determine, you know, are we affecting? And, you know, when you hear like some of the some of the things Isabella said when, when she's testified for these bills, um, you said that drive through voting was something that was used mostly by some of the minority communities. But in our in our reality, when we looked at our data, we said, actually, those are the communities that have less access, less access to vehicles. So you hurt them more by going you know, by making them travel further or depending more on a car. So so even that contrast. Right. Um, is there we, we looked at, you know, like you were saying, having small buildings and communities. Well, with this bill, if if this school that is, you know, uh, half a mile from a state district limit, state Senate seat works, and I have to move it over here. Now I'm losing one. And it's just, you know, in the same area serving the same people, but I'm losing it. So again, a lot of having to be on the ground and see where people are going is what I would like to see and factored in to determine these things. So there's been a lot of focus on the effect of these new restrictions on marginalized voters, particularly voters of color. But I also want to make sure that we address the potential effects for voters with disabilities. You know, uh, originally SB7 required some voters to provide proof of disability if they wanted to vote by mail all year. There was another provision in the House that would have required people helping voters to disclose the reason someone needed help, even if it was for medical reasons. Those are both gone now. But there is still the possibility that Texas could allow poll watchers to video record people receiving assistance and filling out their ballots um, if the poll watcher believes that the help is unlawful. And, you know, that's a provision that has drawn particular concerns uh, about the possible intimidation of voters with disabilities. You know, you think of voters with intellectual or developmental disabilities who may require assistance through things like prompting or questioning, things that could be misconstrued as coercion. You know, I'm not allowed in a polling place unless I am voting because I am a member of the media. But I I do want to ask you all how you see something like this playing out, right? Like you all see these these interactions more often than I might. So walk me through the potential fallout or effect of of something like this. I'll I'll take that one first. I think... um, You know, when we talk about voter suppression and barriers to voting, right, these are very kind of nebulous, heady ideas. But um, I like to think of myself as an average human being, and I hate filling out forms. You know, if I have to fill out a paper form, I'm much likely, much more likely to put it off for several days. I think that is probably the same as most normal, you know, kind of average everyday Americans. If you're uh, folks with kids, if you have a disability, right, like having to fill out more forms in and of itself is just so aggravating that it might get you to not, right, fill out that form or do whatever it is. And so I kind of use that as think about that, just how annoyed we get at everyday activities. Now, say you're going to a voting center. And uh, for example, in in Houston and, and on top of that, Harris County, 
because of a lawsuit from several years ago, we actually are still under uh, essentially a, a pre-clearance of sorts with ADA accessibility. So all of our locations, we have to submit months in advance to a subject matter expert who goes and determines if they are ADA accessible. And I'm not just talking about having a ramp. I'm saying that the ramp is at the right height. If it's at 2.0, 2.11 instead of two, as far as a height ratio, we can't use that location. You know, there are things and barriers that we're already dealing with in making sure that we have absolute accessibility for folks who have, you know, bearing physical abilities. And it's not just folks who are documented as, right, you know, have that handicap placard or whatever. It is also older folks or younger folks who I've had knee surgery, right? I've had to be on crutches, people who are temporarily disabled who still have to make it through these functions. But to the original point, you're there. You've been, you know, maybe waiting in line for two to three minutes. Uh, you're already nervous about the voting process. Uh, you're already not sure, you know, having an assistant there. Uh, it's been a contentious presidential election. So, you know, there's a lot of poll watchers around. And then you get there and all of a sudden you have to fill out yet another piece of paperwork. Right now, say you make it through that paperwork, but you forgot your driver's license. And now, uh, you know, instead of filling out the other forms that would allow you to vote in that time, you're saying, ah, well, I'm, I want to go back home and get my driver's license and come back another time. But it's those little barriers like now that I have to go back home, am I going to come back? Is something going to happen in my life? Am I going to get in a car wreck or get COVID that I won't be able to come back to vote? You know, if I do get my driver's license, I had a really bad experience thinking about the anxiety of having to fill out even more forms. And I think proponents of this would say, well, they just don't care about voting enough. You know, they, they must just not love America enough to come vote. But the reality is we're human beings that anything that would cause even a little bit of friction that gets us away from that voting location ultimately could prevent us from coming back because of the other things that happen in life. And so that is my concern with uh, having kind of even more steps in the process, having even more points where people could be questioned and intimidated is a big word, but I mean, just feeling uncomfortable because they are being watched, because they're being questioned. And even that kind of conflict of being questioned for how you're writing your name, who is this person? Are they really your sibling? Are they really your caretaker? You know, people don't want to feel uncomfortable ever. And so, I, you know, I, I, I want to break it down that these are human beings. These are fellow neighbors and friends who are just trying to go there, cast their vote and go on about their day. Um, and so I, I worry about the friction points that this will add and this perception that somehow um, the most nefarious actors, as, as Heider said, could be, you know, evil administrators, elections administrators, or could be um, people who just happen to have a physical disability or other dev developmental disability that ne they need assistance. Is that, you know, when we're talking about election fraud, is that who you're really wanting to go after? Is that what you're really concerned about? Because uh, that. That's I, I would worry about that coming off as insulting. And I think that's ultimately why those portions of the bill got stripped, um, because it just isn't consistent with reality in how many people we help and how many assistants there are out there in the world. And so I know that was a long winded answer of saying that I just it's it's the drip, the water drip, the constantly just chipping away in ways big and small that I'm worried about. I, you know, I don't. I'm careful when I answer these questions because I also don't want ever to sound like I'm being, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that people with a disability are less capable of filling a form than, than people who don't have a disability or anything, right? Um, so so I, I tend to be a little less into that part of it. Um, I understand, again, the spirit of why these things are done. We just had on May 1st an election where a city council was one seat, I can't remember the city, but was won by two votes. Got 99, the other one got 97. So, you know, every vote counts. Everything is important because, again, someone who's a city council member today is a mayor tomorrow, is a state rep, and, you know, is a leader in politics in the future. And so every, you know, all politics are local. It's very important to keep it clean down to the last vote if you can. Um, but, but I do think that is something that has to come from the community with this, uh, voters with disabilities to say, hey, how do we feel about this, right? Um, I think, you know, if they need assistance, they should be able to get it from whoever they feel comfortable getting it, right? If they want to bring someone day or if it's a poll worker, that's fine. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I would call it a barrier more than probably a hassle to get another step, like Isabel was saying, than having to fill out another form. Now, disclosing information, you know, why you need assistance. 
I really don't like that part. I mean, I don't, I don't want to tell people why I need assistance. What if I have a medical condition? You know, what if I have something I haven't even told my own family members yet because I'm not ready to talk about it. I mean, so I do think that part is a little invasive. Um, now, when it comes to watchers, I do have, you know, a completely different experience. Um, I've, I've said this and I said it in November. In November, there was a whole conversation about, oh, there are going to be watchers everywhere and people are going to be intimidated. And I said it publicly and I will always say it. Watchers are not a bad thing and watchers should be welcome in the process. But watchers have to follow the rules too. And that's what makes it work. There was not a single incident with watchers in Tarrant County. And even with everything we went through with the remake of the ballots, we had dozens of them here for days and we got along fine. We gave them access to everything they needed. They followed the rules. It was all good. Um, it's just a matter of having the rules clear and be important. Now, recording at the polling place is another thing you asked about. You know, that's, again, elections, and I say this all the time, but I don't mean it as a joke, but just as an expression, it's like Cheryl Crow says, it's, you know, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. You know, if you go, if you go to a state like California, you can actually take a picture of yourself in the voting booth. You know, a recording device in a polling place is not seen as something terrible or bad. Because people are used to it and people accept it. I don't, it's not accepted here. So maybe if it's going to be introduced, again, clear rules, very clear guidance. We're going to need a lot of help from the state in saying when can, when can't, and what kind of authority the, the, the judge has to, um, you know, say, hey, you can't do this or you got to stop. But again, it's only as good as the effect it has on the voters and, and how well they accept what you put in front of them as a process. So we are unfortunately out of time, but I want to ask one more question. I'm just going to move us over a little bit from that deadline. Um, because last time I, I had local officials in a discussion like this, I asked them a version of this question and it led to some interesting answers. So I'm going to ask you all as well. Imagine you have this sort of boatload of magic legislative fairy dust, and it allows you to make the legislature do all the things you wanted so that you could better run your elections what would be the one thing at the top of your wish list? What's, what's number one on there? <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump out. I, I can't limit to just one, Alexa. But I will say, you know, uh, this, this might be a little out of bounds. Uh, you know, I would love for the legislature to, uh, to have the courage to fix other problems uh, like the weatherization, right? You know, when we go into a freeze and then people have pipe bursts in their home and now they've got to decide between fixing their home and their, you know, getting a car for the next couple months. If they don't have a car, they can't go vote in the future, right? Like there are things that uh, are happening with the legislature that haven't been answered that could ultimately help people vote. But if you want to keep me just to voting, um, Oh, shucks. Uh, there's like a whole nerdy list. I think that we've all been talking about things like mail ballot envelope design. You know, instead of cramming so many things that are at like six point font that older folks can barely read. What if we had the capacity to say, OK, what can we do to make a mail ballot envelope actually user friendly to the voter and put all of the you know legal information we need to on flyers that then they read as well in those ballots? You know, kind of very technical aspects of uh, making sure, you know, to Heidrich's point of uh, when we're doing laws, when we're getting, you know, ballots from position A to position B, what are the containers that we're allowed to put them in? Can we put them in locked bags? Can we put them in locked envelopes? Uh, does it have to be a box, right? What is a box? You know, kind of getting into those very nerdy technical questions that come up uh, would be much more fascinating to me than the discussions that have come up so far. I'm going to stay, I'm going to say my turf and stick to elections. Um, I, I'm going to, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of those. And by the way, Isabel, we, we, yeah, the secretary of state has, hopefully will surprise you. They will surprise us all this year with the envelope redesign, but um, I'll give you two. One that is doable and one is just me being extremely nerdy. Um, online voter registration. I think there are ways to make online voter registration safe, accessible, um, to make it so that people who have concerns about the roles can feel confident about it. I think there are ways, even if not to, everyone at least to a certain segment to start doing something right and that's doable that's something that could be started you know tomorrow if if if, if we wanted to and and the other one the one i don't think i'll see in my lifetime but i wish um it's because i'm an engineer i'm a geek i'm a software engineer i would love to see internet voting to be honest with you um i think i would trust my phone more to recognize my fingerprint than, than, you know, a signature, someone who is looking at my signature and saying, yeah, that looks, that looks fairly like the other one. Um, biometrics are definitely a lot, for my opinion, secure. So 
but that's going to take long. That goes back to what I was saying a while ago. You know, it's only as good as how people perceive it. And that would take a lot of work and a lot of, you know, uh, time to little by little put into play in Texas. But I would love to see something like that. Well, I w wish we could keep this conversation going. Heider, you surprised me with that last one, <laughs> given that yeah. we, we're in the minority of states without online voter registration to begin with. <laughs> but um, I, I so appreciate both of you all for joining us today. Like I said, I wish we had more time. Uh, thank you for the folks who have tuned in and watched this conversation. For more coverage from the Texas Tribune, you can visit texastribune.org and you can get the latest updates on the people and policies shaping the future of Texas with our weekly newsletter at trib.it slash brief weekly. Heider, Isabel, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you all next time. Thank you.